You know battling food in your body doesn't work. You want to love and accept yourself. And because you're insatiable, you want results too. And wouldn't you know, you bring the same intensity to your life, wanting to maximize your time, potential, and experiences you have here on this beautiful and wondrous planet Earth. Fair warning, it will be a roller coaster. But for those insatiable, that's your prime time to thrive. We're here to say yes to the hunger of wanting it all. I'm your co-host, Ali Shapiro, a health coach who helps people end the losing battle of dieting and find a truce with food. And I'm Juliette Berg, nutritionist, fitness expert, and the co-owner of Unite Fitness Studio Franchise. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 12 of Insatiable. We are here with Dr. Kelly Brogan the newly author of A Mind of Your Own. Juliet and I are so excited today. We have so many questions. I had been following Kelly's work for years and about, I think it was back in November, Kelly? She wrote, yeah. Yeah, she wrote this great article about resilience, which Juliet and I are always talking about <laughs> on the podcast or how resilience is a measure of health. And um, I made a comment on Kelly's blog about how I approach that in my practice and she reached out to me and she was as lovely in person <laughs> as she is on the page and, and just super down to earth and also very smart. So we are super excited to have her today. Before we get to uh, talking about her book and really fascinating information about depression and how it shows up in women, which I know our audience is going to be really, really intrigued by, I want to give you her official bio. Kelly Brogan, MD, is a Manhattan-based holistic women's health psychiatrist author of the book, A Mind of Your Own, and co-editor of the landmark textbook, Integrative Therapies for Depression. She completed her psychiatric training and fellowship at NYU Medical School after graduating from Cornell University Medical College and has a BS from MIT in Systems Neuroscience. I love systems. <laughs> she is a board certified in psychiatry, psychosomatic medicine, and integrative holistic medicine, and is specialized in a root cause resolution approach to psychiatric syndromes and symptoms. She is on the board of Greed Med Info, Functional Medicine University, Pathways to Family Wellness, NYS Perinatal Association, and Fisher Wallace, Medical Director for Fearless Parent, and board member for Health Freedom Action in the peer-reviewed index journal, Alternative Therapies and Health and Medicine. She is a mother of two. Kelly, how do you have time? I know, I'm reading this. I'm like, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I think it just basically speaks to how much debt I have. I think that's mostly uh, <laughs> what that bio is about. Well, no, I just feel like all I, what that says to me is so much advocacy. And really, I think what I love about you is your quest for truth. And I think that's actually kind of what I want to open up with because your journey, I think, is fascinating. And you mentioned a little bit in the book, but tell us a little bit how you went from super cerebral, analytical, science, science, science to a new understanding of science and how we access that complexity. So it's been, as I've mentioned, a parallel process because as much as I'm interested in what is going on on the global sphere in terms of perceptions of health and medicine and really have been for a long time. I mean, even when I was at MIT, I directed health conferences and was very interested in sort of big picture. I fancy myself sort of like a minor philosopher of sorts, I guess. I'm just interested in patterns and unfoldments. And my personal process began essentially in my pregnancy, uh, which was during my fellowship. At the end of my medical training, I was pregnant with my first and I was, you know, at the, the pinnacle of my sort of, you know, masculine energy at that point in my life. And when I say that, and I know some people are sort of resistant to these reductionist categories, masculine and feminine energy, what does that even mean? For me, what that meant and what feels true is that I was coming from a space of seeking to succeed, focused very much on ambition, productivity, and I had this driving sense that if I just put enough time, effort, and intellect into what I was seeking to master, I'd get there. And then I'd have some 
feeling, some powerful feeling I was seeking, right? And I was at the pinnacle of that when I became pregnant. And so I approached pregnancy from that space where I was like, you know, I'd been on birth control, for example, for 12 years because who needs a menstrual cycle? It's a total pain in the ass, right? Of course, that, that's what I thought. And so I didn't have, I basically continuous cycled birth control for almost, you know, over a decade, had a little bit of trouble. You know, my cycle didn't come back after I stopped it. And I was like, I'm going to crack this code. And got myself pregnant totally unconsciously, meaning like I I wasn't preparing my body or my lifescape or my mindscape for pregnancy. It was just something I decided to do like so many women. And in my pregnancy, I began to figure out, well, what is the the most evidence-based way to proceed with this pregnancy? And I've always been a data nut. I always spent a lot of, a lot of time on PubMed.gov and I began to research it, began to research, you know, what I could about epidurals and C-section and ultrasound, certain recommendations, you know, everything spanning from Tylenol to vaccines in pregnancy. And I, I applied that to my experience and it was, began to create a dissonance for me because what I had been taught in medical school and what I was learning through my research were worlds apart. So I ended up having, um, you know, a a natural birth, not because I was interested in some transformative experience, but because I had convinced myself that that was actually best, you know, from a scientific perspective for this baby. And of course that opened Pandora's box spiritually for me, where I came in into contact with a part of my primal energy and force that I'd never known even existed, let alone didn't know that I was suppressing it actively. So, the, you know, the following years, uh, basically, I, I began to deconstruct everything I had learned, you know, spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and blood, sweat and tears putting into my training. And I, I had to learn to let it all go. And it was a several year process, probably seven years, actually culminating in my work with my now late mentor, Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez, who took me the final stretch, you know, in in the seven months before he died in July to really, you know, help me to, to hold my certainties very lightly. You know, certainties from like gluten is bad for everyone to, you know, no one should ever take synthetic folic acid to, you know, all of these, the dogma. He helped me to let go of any shred of dogma um, and I'm happy to talk more about that, but it's it's been a process of of surrendering to a different type of approach to health in the body, personally and and on a professional level. So what I hear you saying, which is interesting, because you're very big into intuition and everything, which I think is so important, and that's often when I'm working with my clients yeah. is getting them to trust their own experience. But what I love is you're saying you don't just discard like the intellect, right? But you bring up the intuitive knowing exactly just as strongly because what it sounds like in your experience that what you learned in medical school was one version of science, but then there was another version of science out there. Where is that disconnect? I'm very curious myself. Like who it's, curated it's, medical <laughs> education? Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a very important question. And, and the truth is that the question is not just about medical school, right? It's about just about all of the information that is disseminated uh, around elements related to, you know, everything from, from climate change to planetary <laughs> health and wellness and animal welfare, you know, to, to the chemical industry, to the food industry, Where do we get our information? How do we get it? And who are we trusting uh, as a source of information that encompasses the the whole of the truth, if there is such a thing? So in the medical realm, it's very clear that there are leagues deep, I would say, uh, layers of corruption and conflicts of interest. In fact, I just wrote an article about the fact that there's a movement to change the term from conflicts of interest, which of course means that in decision making around what's best for the health of the population, you're being influenced by industry connections, right? So you're essentially being paid by pharma. But there is a movement to change it from the term conflicts of interest to confluence of interest, right? Like it's just it's just like a co-occurrence, you know, it's not a big deal. But the, it's these subtle, these subtle little manipulative tools that have allowed for I don't know, like interweaving of systems that really are best kept segregated and the educational system, the clinical practice model and the pharmaceutical industry uh, with the government sort of lording over the entire cohort 
it's become almost one entity. And I don't think I realized that to any extent in my training. You know, I remember going out because when I was in medical school, being courted by the pharmaceutical industry was still very big. And, you know, I went to Nobu and all of these fancy five star restaurants for years. During, and and you, there's such a you're such an indentured servant during your training that to be taken out to a fancy restaurant or given like a pen feels like something you're almost entitled to and you become so nourished by it. It's sad. But of course, that's the psychology at work there. And and I remember saying to a friend who was actually very much against, a colleague, a co-resident, who was very much against these kinds of dinners, like, I would know if I was being influenced. I would know if I was prescribing more Risperdal because I was taken out by Janssen Pharmaceuticals last night. Come on. But of course, the data demonstrates just the opposite, that in fact, despite the fact that physicians feel that they are impervious to such influence, in fact, they absolutely demonstrate in their prescription pad, you know, and and it may be from something as innocent as like an empathic, you know, sort of human response that we naturally have with other people who have expectancies of us. So it's not necessarily a bad quality, but it's being put to a, a rather dangerous use. So there is um, the pharmaceutical industry is, is a business. They're beholden to their shareholders, and they're doing what what they set out to do. They they never asserted you know their mission to be your health, wellness, and well being. That's not what they're here for. They're here for profit, and it's it only becomes confusing and sort of like activating of some deep denial when the government protects those interests over ours, right? Because we feel we want to depend on the government. There has to be somebody looking out, right? There has to be someone guarding the hen house, right? And so it's almost too much for many people to accept that it could be the fox, unfortunately. And I understand that because it's quite a scary transition to move through to understand that all of the information you're getting should be subject to review, you know, and should be subject to vetting on another level. So it's, it's, it's a tough thing to wake up to. And frankly, most people wake up to it because they've been injured by this, you know, conglomeration. Now in your book, you talk about that you no longer are prescribing medications. Um, So how did you go? First of all, I'm curious, how did you get into psychiatry? What led you down that medical path? Uh, so I was a neuroscience major in college, and I've always been very interested, again, my sort of like interest in the meta picture. I've been very, very interested in human behavior, and I figured, oh, well, you know, we've cracked the code of human behavior. We've totally figured out why people do what they do and how what happens when the brain goes awry in its functioning, and that's called neuroscience, right? So I studied that, and the, and the clinical extension of that, of course, is psychiatry. I worked uh, actually a suicide hotline at MIT, and MIT is unfortunately notorious for having many completed suicides every year, and I worked this hotline, and it was supervised by a psychiatrist. So I met with him regularly, and I was just so interested in in the curious way that he looked at what many people can't even touch, you know, this, this idea of pain so deeply that it, it causes you to self-extinguish, you know, that runs so deep. It, it's very difficult, obviously, for many people to engage with that with any degree of comfort. And so I was very fascinated by that. And I went to medical school to become a psychiatrist. But along the way, my sort of like feminist, native feminist inclination bubbled up to the surface. And I decided that I wanted to become an obstetrician. Uh, but it only took one clerkship rotation in my third year of medical school to convince me that that's about the most miserable profession on the face of the earth. I mean, those, you know, and the statistics bear that out. I mean, it's, it's quite, a, quite a ill-constructed model for clinical practice. I mean, these, these people are expected to deliver babies, to operate on cancers, you know, to do bread and butter GYN. And nowhere in there is like being a women's health advocate, which is, of course, what I was interested in, knowing my patients on a deep level and helping shepherd them through their experience. So then I I learned about a a burgeoning specialty called reproductive psychiatry, which was like the marriage of the two. Ah. And so I was one of, you know, in the early, early crop of those uh, specialists. And I specialize in, of course, what that unfortunately translates to is um, a specialty in medicating pregnant and breastfeeding women with psychotropics and by extension, medicating women who struggle with PMS and menopause. Got it. Yeah. Which is still so prevalent that, you know, I know Allie and I have, have clients that come to us that are 
dealing with those issues, having reproductive issues, or they're trying to have a child or whatever it may be, and they're on medications and they yes. are like, I don't want to be on these medications anymore because I want to try to have a baby or, you know, I know that. So that is a really touchy subject for a lot of people. Yeah. And Kelly, I want you to tell everyone, you know, a lot of people of your patients come at that time in their lives when they want to get off medication. But I think it's really important for us to define depression for people, because one of the things that was amazing in your book was, you know, people think you I think you use the phrase like people think it's a sad woman on the couch at home at night. And that's not how your clients depression presents in women. So I'd love for you to explain to people, first of all, how are you even defining depression? Yes. So first of all, it's very important for me that the take home message be that depression is a symptom, right? So, so it is not a diagnosis. It is not a heritable disease. It is just an indication of imbalance. And so like a fever, it doesn't tell you a whole lot of the source of that imbalance. Is it viral, bacterial, fungal? Is it, you know, none of the above? It just tells you that something is amiss. I tend to focus because I feel like it's such a natural point of entry for so many people in our time right now. I tend to focus on healing the body first, but of course there are many different practitioners and healers out there who focus on healing the spirit first, healing energetic, you know, vibrations first. There are other ways to get at it, but my bias is to to work with the body first because I I love like the Maslow's hierarchy, right, which is like fulfilling these most basic needs so that the body experiences a sense of safety and so that then you can start to liberate your thoughts because when you're not preoccupied with your with your constipation with your hair falling out with you know a sense of constant inner agitation i mean this is actually what people are calling depression these days you know these days depression is a sense of often of simultaneous inner discord like inner dis-ease, right? Like, so this, this sense of like, something is just off, it's off, it's off. And we call it anxiety, right? But it manifests in many different ways externally, but that's at the root. And then it's like this layer of disconnection. So people feel flat, they feel hopeless. Often they feel like largely disconnected from any sense of purpose or motivation or interest. And that can extend to sex. It can extend to anything that resembles food. So of course, what they end up, you know, working towards is the more addictive types of foods that seem to touch on a sense of pleasure or satisfaction. So, you know, processed food, namely, it looks like a picture of global sickness, right? And actually in the research, that's what depression is referred to when we are characterizing it in the animal model, it's called sickness syndrome. And sickness syndrome refers to an inflammatory state in the body that is actually designed physiologically to slow the body down for recuperation. So you, you, so, so you don't have sex, you don't interact with other beings, you, you stop eating, you, you conserve resources for healing. Um, and that's what you know, depression is depicted as in the uh, animal model. And so that really piqued my interest in exploring what is referred to as the inflammatory model of depression. Now, do I think every case of depression is, a, is an instance of inflammation? No. Do I think the vast majority of what we're calling depression as evidenced by this evolutionary mismatch of the lifestyles we're living and the lifestyles our genes over millions of years have expected to see? Yeah, I think that's a big part of what's going on and why one in four women are taking medications as they go into a potential pregnancy. But I always love this idea like, oh, I wouldn't, I don't want to take a medication during pregnancy. Like what's good enough for pregnancy is good enough for you. Like, well, You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. say that. It's dichotomy. Or mm-hmm. it's like saying, oh, women should only take care of themselves if they're procreating. <laughs> exactly. No, it's, it's, it's a strange standard, but it speaks to some intuitive sense that that there is a standard we could hold ourselves to that when we're doing it for someone else, like a fetus, you know, we can connect to that, but to do it for our own life experience is something we've almost been conditioned not to engage. Are you connecting depression and anxiety kind of simultaneously as the same sort of sickness syndrome or do you separate the two? It's a great question. Personally, in my um, almost decade of, of practice in this particular arena, I have never seen a case of self-described depression without a component of 
agitation or anxiety. Mm -hmm. So I think they co-occur. Anxiety can be as simple as a sense of vigilance, you know, or a sense of like, I need to be doing more. What should I be doing? I'm aware, you know, just that running tape. Or it can manifest as panic attacks or what we call obsessive compulsive disorder, specific phobias. You know, it can manifest in many different ways. But anxiety, it serves a purpose, of course, as all bodily expressions and, and mental expressions do. They, it serves a purpose, but when it is hyper stimulated because there is such a level of wrongness about lifestyle, it can obviously eclipse any ability to experience your life. And it's amazing right. how in this era we live in where it's complete instant gratification with everything and people are overworked and they don't take time out for themselves. You know, a lot of my clients are on anti-anxiety medicine simply because they're just so stressed out that it's, like you said, the reoccurring tape and the agitation just gets to be way too much for them. And they're like, I, they need that sedative feeling. They can't right. go on, but they're not addressing any, any of the actual issues. It's just putting a bandaid over them. 100%. So we say in functional medicine, it's like if you have a piece of glass stuck in your foot and you just take a Tylenol for it. I mean, yeah, who knows? Maybe it'll, it'll offer you like the little bit of relief you might feel you need for those six hours, but any mentating being would tell you that's a crazy thing to do. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, our model, our entire medical model. So again, I don't love to just slam psychiatry. I love to slam medicine on the whole. <laughs> and it's conventional Equal opportunities here. <laughs> totally. Are. Totally. And no, listen, I should say that I have come to a place and Allie and I have discussed this. I have come to a place where I actually do believe that if conventional allopathic medicine feels right to you and it is working for you, go with grace. Do your I mean, thing. You talk a lot about the belief systems with people, yes, how much that totally, impacts. I mean, totally so much right. of your book, as I was reading, is a lot about the placebo effect with a lot of medications and how powerful that is and not that that actual medication is doing anything. You know, sometimes it's doing more harm than good, but a lot of it's just that belief in this is going to help me. Right. And what we're struggling with, I think now, which is kind of cool, is that culturally and collectively, our beliefs are shifting, where I think we're all starting to lose some of the placebo effect that had been offered when some of these drugs first came out. Mm. Because we're all starting to see that, like, we may have been sold a bit of a bill of goods here. And, and there may be a little more to the story that we don't know. And so it's like almost collectively, our beliefs are impacting the potential placebo effect of any given medication that's delivered now. And we see that in the, in the billions of dollars that people spend in America on, on supplements and alternative medicine. You know, it's, it's bearing out that there is a bankruptcy in this model that will ultimately be its undoing. But as you said, you know, the, the difference between the allopathic and conventional model and what I'm proposing is that if we are looking at depression and anxiety as an invitation, right, or as a message, there is a process that has to be engaged of shifting consciousness, right? So I'm interested in, that's what I'm interested in. I'm not just interested in getting your symptoms gone so you can get back to work and functioning in your miserable life that isn't suited for you. That's actually the pharmaceutical model. Get you back to work. That's the model. The, this alternative paradigm is really interested in something different. It's moving you through the significance, the message, the meaning of those symptoms so that you can get to a next step, get to a next chapter. And, you know, and I have experiences with my patients that are profound. I mean, it's, you know, I have patients who, who end up coming out of the closet, they move to Europe, they quit their job, they, you know, adopt babies that, you know, they, they open up doors to their life experience that were never available to them and certainly never would have been available to them if their only interest had been in getting their symptoms gone. And I think it's the same for, you know, what Allie and I do with coaching clients with any type of, you know, disordered eating and food issues. It's the same kind of thing, Allie. I, you've seen it, right? I've had clients divorce their husbands. I had a client, you know, move to Europe 
exactly. to, to go to business school, you know, when they were a lawyer, but they really were interested in entrepreneurship. You know, it's incredible what healing something like that can do to kind of get you to that next level of like who you truly are, what your sole purpose is. Yes. Yeah. I mean, Kelly, I'm such a big picture person too. Like I love the global aspect and you were saying how, you know, oh, I think it's inflammation, but some people might say it's spiritual, but to me, they're actually not separate. I think that's true. Yeah. Like the same way that people like cancer's on the rise. I'm like, well, there's also cancer's inf- inflammatory and, and we have global warming going on. But I think people are very emotionally inflamed by being out of alignment. And sure. when we talked, you know, talked about it, resilience, one of the bo- one of the points that really stuck out in your book, I actually wrote it down, page 14. <laughs> a lot of depression and moods are the mind's interpretation of its own safety and power. Yes. And there's there's so much packed in that one sentence. <laughs> but we were talking about these consciousness and these beliefs. And I think we were all sold this good bill of goods that we would feel safe if we didn't have any challenges. If we, you know, everything went according to plan. And I'm a big believer in paradox and the Tao Te Ching. And so real safety comes through going through uncertainty. 100%. It's like you get, you know, you get what what you want when you let go of it. It's, it's, it is that the, the power of paradox is very operative in this, in this space. You know, I think there is no room. I was just telling a patient this this morning, you know, her father died somewhat suddenly and, and she's never missed a day of work in her adult life. And she's struggling with feeling like she needs, uh, I don't know, a couple of days to integrate this experience. You know, there's just absolutely no room in our society for everything grief. falling <laughs> for grief, of course. And in fact, as an aside in the DSM five, which is the diagnostic manual for psychiatry, the dictionary of disorders, Grief has now largely been pathologized if it lasts more than two weeks. So, of course, that's like, yeah. Two weeks for grief? Yes, yes. It's like symptomatic grief. Oh, like it's linear, too. Wow. (laughs) Wow. I mean, it's poetic. It's like almost like they're showing their hand. You know, it's like, you guys have gone too far. If you were just a little more subtle about your intentions, you might be able to pull this off for a little while longer. But um, you know what I mean? But it's there's no room for, for everything falling apart. And sometimes you know, people require maybe uh, a Phoenix process as Elizabeth Lesser refers to it, you know, the author. I love that phrase. It's this idea that there is a moving through the fire that is required for you to actually incarnate as your truer self. And that is so anathema to our consciousness in this country where the focus is on outsourcing your freedoms so that you can feel safe and remaining functional at all costs. So it's the, you know, the productivity model and it's just not working anymore. And that's a good thing. You know, it's a good thing that it's not working anymore. I mean, the more medications that people are, are on, the more medications that are created, the sicker people are getting. So it's clearly not working. We have more psychiatric problems than ever before and more diagnoses than ever before. That always really interests me when they come out with just like new diagnosis after diagnosis with any kind of mental health problem. And I'm like, Okay, so they just made that one. Like, I just think they just made that one up because someone has a new phobia. So, you know, they have X cases. So then they're just like, let's write this in. Okay. Yeah. So in psychiatry, it's a funny thing, right? Because unlike other realms of medicine, there are no objective tests, right? We don't do brain scans or, you know, any sort of some psychiatrists don't even do basic blood work. There is no means beyond just a subjective impression of delivering a diagnosis to a given patient. So the DSM has ballooned since its inception in in 1952. And of course, like in the 70s, they cast out homosexuality, which used to be a diagnosable condition. I mean, this is the nature of what we're talking about. Almost all of the, the white men, old white men on the board of the DSM have conflicts of interests. And it's just a, a charade. But the most compelling data that I speak about in, in my book, because it was really a turning point for me of uh, awakening, is presented by the journalist Robert Whitaker, and he wrote a, a book called Anatomy of an Epidemic. And in it, he, he makes the claim that you just alluded to, which is that we have ever escalating access to, to treatment, quote unquote, we have more and more people medicated, essentially, for psychiatric illness than ever before in the history of time. So why is it that we also have the highest rates of mental health disability ever, you know, and, and that depression is the number one cause 
of disability globally. Like, shouldn't those be inversely proportional where more treatment equals less disability? And so his entire treatise unfolds to, to demonstrate that actually it looks like medication is perpetuating and propagating this epidemic of disability. How can that be? And the answer is that medication, first of all, we, we, have, so, we have a keyhole perspective on what these medications are even doing. It's a total fallacy that they are fixing anything. They're not fixing anything. They're forcing your body to adapt to a chemical stimulus that in many cases, and particularly in the case of antidepressants, renders you so dependent physically that in some cases it is not possible to function physiologically off of these medications. That is where I learned through through the most challenging process in my clinical career, I learned through my patients why I needed to put my prescription pad down. And it was because when I read this book, I started taking all my patients off of medication with their consent, of course, <laughs> and interest, again, because so many of my patients are pre-pregnancy, it's sort of a model population for that type of motivation. Yeah. And what happened, what ensued was horrific. I was basically running like an outpatient rehab center and I had no idea what was going on. Patients were paging me at all hours of the night with like the most bizarre neurologic and physiologic symptoms and suicidality. And, and then I started to, to look into this and I've learned a lot of what I know from other patients, from grassroots movements to raise awareness around the dangers of these medications. And now finally, as of this past year, There are research groups who are actually putting out data that says and reifies this idea that these medications are addictive, habit-forming, and cause a very dangerous withdrawal syndrome in many patients. That's one thing I really got from your book, Kelly, because I I mean, I had tried antidepressants several before. I eventually did have the same problem you talked about. I took my, my primary care doctor was the one prescribing them, and then I remember being in her office and being like, I don't want these anymore. And she turned, she's like, okay, one second. And she turns around to this massive book and like probably thumbed to Wellbutrin and was like, um, you should be able to get off that in four weeks. And I was like, okay, like looking back now, I'm like, she clearly had no context, right? But I had. But there's a protocol, right? Like there's only so, it's like you're saying, like sometimes people are just shooting in the dark. Yeah. Well, they all are. And that's what I think. They all are, yeah. From the book (laughs) that, that I really got is that, and it's so important. And, you know, you use the analogy of like if you have glass in your foot and then you take Tylenol. Yeah, it may help you, but also it, it's making things worse because you're, you're hitting that heel with glass in it. Hmm. And I think it's so important when people, you have to read the book, obviously, <laughs> but to realize that there is a cost to medication. It's not just something I think a lot of people are like, oh, I'll just use this to get by for an, a year or they, they don't understand the full consequences and that there is a cost for if you you may need them, and I'd love to hear Juliet and I both want to hear if like do you are you completely against meds, whatever. But I think that what your book highlights so importantly is that there is a cost, and it's really important to do your due diligence before you decide that this is something for you. One hundred. Yeah, and I was going to say to Kelly, you know, just like Ali has had her own experience with antidepressants. Both my mother and my twin brother are diagnosed bipolar. My mm-hmm. mom bipolar and borderline personality disorder is the next one they added on to it. Tag it, it was schiz- yeah. They tagged on schizophrenia, then they tagged, then they took it away. Then they put on the BDD. I was like, okay, can't keep up here. So but anyways, nice. so for, you know, she's going to be in her late fifties. So since she's, you know, she's dealt with her first episode since she was like 19 and then she had a complete remission, wasn't on medication at all until she was about 40. And she claims that the thing that kind of start like restarted her a psychosis was she had been prescribed a lot of pseudofedrin for mm-hmm. she had like a head cold sinus infection and the doctor like pres- over prescribed her like take this much every hour and she had like a complete psychotic break from pseudofed <laughs> or pseudo- right. I guess and then yeah, yeah. ever since then it was she's just been on medication in and out of hospitals can't get off the medications on a ton of benz, benzodiazepines which is you know as you know one of the most addicting medications yes. that the withdrawal is like coming off of probably like a heroin you know you know so but yeah so i think that both Ali and i are really curious about that with someone with maybe that level of a psychiatric need when they're kind of dependent on these medications and the withdrawal is so scary like, are, you know, is what, how do you kind of navigate that? 
Yeah. So I think a lot of people, you know, and I have plenty of critics out there, but I think a lot of people, you know, like to imagine that I, you know, I have a Madison Avenue practice and I treat only the worried well and, you know, women who want to know how many potatoes to eat every week or not, you know, (laughs) or whatever. But in fact, I have patients with diagnoses of schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, OCD, the whole spectrum. While the vast majority of the patients that I treat have clinical depression, many of whom have been diagnosed with very severe and treatment resistant is a very popular term for when psychiatry bumps up against the wall it has created for itself, treatment resistant depression. I don't believe that there is a single case of mental illness on the planet today that would not best be served by first doing no harm. And first doing no harm to me looks first, like restoring a setting for that patient's lifestyle to unfold in a very different way. And, and when I, you know, I, I, cause I have suicidal patients in my practice, et cetera. And, and what do we do about suicidality? Cause we, so we lock them in a hospital to watch them. Hey, maybe that's not such a bad idea. Maybe there's actually something very healing about feeling like enough, people care enough to actually keep an eye on you, you know, to, continuously. Okay, not so bad. Then we start them on a medication that we all agree has no mechanistic effect for four to eight weeks, right? So antidepressants, any prescribing psychiatrist would tell you, take that long to quote unquote work. And we could have a whole conversation about what working actually means. But the truth is there's not anything urgent going on chemically. So sometimes we sedate them, right? So we use medications, like you said, benzodiazepines to sedate patients, to take them out of the intense anguish that might prompt them to do something impulsive. But the problem is that the instances of impulsive and violent behavior, because that's the, what everyone is afraid of, right? That someone's going to kill themselves or kill someone else. Mm-hmm. The instances of impulsive and violent behavior that have been newsmaking, let's say, in this country, if you go to the website SSRI Stories, you can see the confirmation of this, have almost without exception been in patients who have been recently prescribed psychiatric medications or who are tapering off them. And we're talking about school shootings. Correct. Planes coming down, infanticide, you name it. So it's a lovely idea. It's a lovely idea that there could be such a magic pill that is safe and effective and can take you out of the, the, the pain and struggle of your experience. That's a great idea. Unfortunately, I'm here to tell you that that is not the truth. It just doesn't exist. And because it doesn't exist, it, it, it doesn't mean that we just take the next best thing, which is the reality of what we have. It means we have to step back and engage the precautionary principle, right? Which tells us that examining all of the risks, benefits, and alternatives of what we have available needs to happen with every patient for true informed consent. So there are no exceptions in my practice. I, I have prescribed in, in settings of particular postpartum psychosis, sedatives. So Ativan or Clonopin, which are benzodiazepines, I use them for their chemical effect so that I can largely keep patients out of the hospital because that's what would be done in the hospital anyway. And you know what? It, it works the way alcohol works, the way coffee works, the way any drug has can have a predictable effect. But the difference is that sometimes we tell ourselves a story, which is that these drugs are having a healing effect or a corrective effect, but in fact, they're just having a chemical effect. So in states of quote unquote emergency, and I have full cooperation of my patients' families, you know, there's a whole different ethos around my work that I would never recommend anyone try this style of practice if they don't if they're not on the same page in terms of beliefs with everyone involved in, in the patient's care, including, including the patient. So, you know, I just wrote up a, a case, Juliet, of acute psychotic mania that was resolved by charcoal. Okay, so you know what charcoal is? Charcoal yeah, bonds. Yeah. Yeah. I used it so, as a diet tool in, in exactly. college. <laughs> so it binds. It's a detoxing agent. Exactly. It, it, yeah, and she had had a bariatric surgery Mm. And as a result of it, developed essentially a dysbiosis in her gut, 
that triggered psychotic mania. I mean, you could read the case study yourself. It re required no psychiatric medications and she was symptom free with this simple intervention. So how can we integrate that into our mo current model of bipolar disorder, wh which frankly, psychiatry comes up really short in explaining anything about, you but know, let in terms me of ask like you this, because I'm curious, do you believe that she had a predisposition to psychosis and something triggered it versus a, someone else who had had that same bariatric surgery that might not have happened to them because they don't have the same genetic, genetic disposition or is it a chemical imbalance? I know you, you talk a lot about like serotonin and I actually was listening to a podcast that you're on that was called the serotonin myth and I was like, oh, I gotta listen to this, you yeah. know? I think so, we need to explain too, Kelly, if you could, ex you know, for people listening, I think they're still thinking like, oh, this is a one chemical disorder right? Like I just need yep. more yes. serotonin. Yes. Even my brother and mother, you know, it's, we have a chemical imbalance, you know, that's what they tell everybody. And that's what they're told. It's just a chemical imbalance. And this is what I, I have to medicate my chemical imbalance, you know, exactly. for the rest of my life. Exactly. And you know who taught them that? is the very pharmaceutical companies <laughs> that are prescribing and profiting off of the medications for that chemical imbalance. So we are one of two countries in the entire world, New Zealand being the other, that allows for direct-to-consumer advertising, which means that we are taught as civilians about our physiology by the very companies that profit off of our beliefs about our physiology, right? It's, it's a very dangerous and perilous, you know, thing to allow for, right? And doctors, as I've depicted, doctors are also influenced primarily by um, the science that pharmaceutical companies teach them. Okay, so this idea of a chemical imbalance comes from a model of the body that is now completely decimated by new and emerging science around particularly things like the microbiome, which is this idea that remote parts of our body, our endocrine, like hormonal physiology, our brain function, for example, can possibly be controlled and influenced by what is going on in the ecology of our gut. Like those very germs we thought we had to like beat into submission with sanitizers and antibiotics and vaccines, right? In fact, like the, the script has been flipped beyond all imagining. And so now we have the emergence of fields like the one I'm most interested in called psychoneuroimmunology. Sometimes it's called psychoneuroendocrinology. What does that mean? It means all this stuff is related. It's not like brain up, body down anymore the way I learned in my training. So the serotonin myth is, you know, this has been exposed by other great thinkers and I learned from them, people like Joanna Moncrief and Irving Kirsch. They have been writing about the fact that for six decades, there has been a hunt to validate the pharmaceutical claim that depression has anything to do with serotonin. Not like, you know, whether it has to do with high or low or in between, like anything to do with it. And in fact, six decades of literature have not come up with a single validated study in human subjects that demonstrates unequivocally that this is what depression is about. In fact, quite the contrary, where they've, you know, I follow a, a research, Andrews at all, this group, where they've looked at maybe it has to do with high serotonin. And of course, there are antidepressants that have been improved. One is called Stablon, for example, in, in, it's in France, that actually increase serotonin. So, so, so medications that do the exact opposite thing are both approved as antidepressants. Wow. So Prozac and Stablon, for example. And then we have medications like Wellbutrin, and then we have the effects of other non-psychiatric medications like thyroid, hormone, or blood pressure medications. And they all sort of seem to help to the same extent, which is about anywhere from like 10 to 25% efficacy. And of course, then there's a whole model that looks at, well, what is that efficacy really about? And that's where this idea of the role of the placebo effect comes in. And this guy, Irving Kirsch, did brilliant work where he basically unearthed all of the unpublished literature, because there's plenty of that, you know, that was used to approve antidepressants in terms of licensure. And what he found was that 82% of what we are calling the effect of antidepressants is duplicated by placebo. So essentially, they don't work. What I'm trying to say <laughs> is... In a nutshell. <laughs> they don't work. They're dangerous and they're completely overprescribed. We're so talking about all 
all drugs, anti like SSRIs, antidepressants, also like mood stabilizing drugs as well, and antipsychotics. Are you correct? Okay. Uh, that's so my perspective. Or just, my, okay. my book is just about antidepressants. My perspective is that this rhetoric applies, and it's not just my perspective. I'm like an expert curator, so I, I, you know, I know tons of smart people, and I love what they're up to, and I've curated their work. But yes, it applies to every single psychiatric medication. Period. I love in the, you know, for people listening to episode 11, we did a primer for this interview on the gut biome. So episode 11, if you haven't listened to it, go back. I pretty much give a very big overview of it. But I think one way, a great visual, Kelly, in the book, you call it psychobiotics, meaning probiotics, which we talked about in that episode, are this idea that, you know, probiotics can have an effect on mental health. And I think when you, when you said it that, I'm like, wow, it totally kind of, to me, that dispelled this serotonin myth in such a great way because we talked about in episode 11 how the, you know, gut biome is that ecosystem that you're talking about. So I think that's really important for people to realize is that you, it's not often underneath that is this assumption that it's like a one for one, like one problem when really everything's interconnected. Interconnected. Yeah. Makes it complicated, unfortunately, but that's reality. We can deny it all we want, but that's the reality. It is. And I think, you know, for a lot of people, it's overwhelming. And what did you say? I, I know that you require any new patients to take on your 30 day dietary protocol. And I think you had said like, there are people who don't even don't come till years later, you know, because they're not ready, you know, because taking on such a, you know, such an extreme change with their nutrition, that can be really overwhelming for somebody. You know, a lot of it is, is just, it, it's work. You have to do the work. Well, and let's let everyone know, and you'll read in the book, but like, that's your first step, right? Kelly is like looking at someone's nutrition. It's my first step because I am, I still have this like masculine mind, right? I love outcomes. I, I'm very <laughs> totally impatient person and I want change and I want it like yesterday, you know, for most of my patients. So the biggest needle mover I have found for my population, again, that I, that I work with, which is a, a variety of folks is the dietary piece. And, and while there are different diets, you know, I have been deeply influenced by, you know, p- folks like Weston Price and of course my mentor, Nick Gonzalez. There's certainly not one diet, as you know, <laughs> both of you for every person, but there is a template that I use for depression and anxiety that seems to be a very good fit. And there are ancestral explanations for why that might be the case. And it's actually rather simple. So here's the deal. Like, this is an opportunity for radical transformation. When you're ready, here's your menu. If you want to continue struggling and living your, you know, half-baked life, do your thing. But the, the, the experience I have with my patients is that they're here, they're reading this material, they're coming to this appointment, they're speaking to folks like you because there is a, a voice inside them they can no longer ignore. And so if I can convey that this is a, this is a a simple and effective menu that not only will relieve their symptoms, but offer them like untold unexpected benefits. Like you could come in because you're having insomnia and you can't focus at work, but then actually as a result of one month of, of dietary change, you, uh, uh, I don't know, have your libido back, you, you know, your hair is like, no longer falling out. I keep coming up with that because it's a very common complaint in my patients that a lot of them struggle with thyroid dysfunction. And it's, it just unfolds in a way that is so much more abundant than any allopathic model that essentially is just looking at suppressing one symptom and causing like potentially 75 side effects while it does that. There's- Will this help people if they're on medication or do they need to work with somebody first to wean off of their medication and start like you're saying, oh my like a clean slate and then do the diet. Like, oh my what? gosh, I'm so glad you asked that question. I should really lead with this information. So that's a very good reminder. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is like media training for me. No, um, no, I'm very glad you asked that. Here's the deal. I have patients who come to me on medication who are interested in coming off it. I have patients who come to me on medication ambivalent about coming off it. I have patients who never want to take a medication but are symptomatic. And then I have patients who are just interested in wellness strategies or whatever. All of those patients do the same thing. That's when I knew I could write a book because the whole implication of a book is that there's it's impersonal, right? It's like a template for everyone. But the fact is that no matter what you're coming to me for, you're going to do the same thing and it's going to start with diet. So I do not touch a medication dosage 
there's no changes to the medication dosage before one to two months of all of this change. And the change is dietary, but it's also uh, meditation. It's also small amounts of exercise. And then it's sort of detoxing the environment, you know, cleaning products, cosmetics, these sorts of things. So I found out the hard way. Remember when I told you I was running that outpatient rehab? Yeah. That, that is what it looks like when you just try and take patients off of medication without restoring resiliency to the body. There is a much easier way to do it if you actually restore the, the patient to the most optimal expression of their physiology, and then you try and ease them off. And I use compounding pharmacies. I mean, sometimes I take patients off of medication, you know, at like 100th of a milligram a month. It can be very complex work and you don't want to go there until you're ready. I, Kelly, you mentioned, I know you have to go. So I would just, I'm curious in your book, you mentioned a lot about the environmental stuff, which I I love. I'm like, so about that right now. And often, do you think it's, and I know there's not exact percentages, but do you think nutrition is like 50% and then environmentally detoxing is 50 like, or do you feel, because I know for so long, maybe it was because food was my issue. I was like, I got to get my diet, my diet, my diet. But now I'm like, oh my God, it's the environment. It's the environment. Maybe I just need something to worry about. But (laughs) I'm like, you know, I got my Berkey water filter over the years, cleaned up my makeup, but the, I think about the air pollution. I don't have an organic mattress. Like I just think of all this stuff and I'm like, oh my God. So I'm just it's curious a, how you approach yes. that. It's a great question. And if you ask 10, you know, holistic practitioners this question, you get 10 different answers. I think in my approach and my model, your intake you know, your dietary intake is your, is your deepest connection to the natural world. You're doing it all, you know, and, it, and it's the one that you have unfortunately the most control over, despite the fact that we're losing control over many elements of it. You know, environmental exposures can really put you into a fear state because we are, you know, we're, what we're breathing, what we're drinking, what we're exposed to through our skin is a, is a very scary reality. The fact that, that Roundup, you know, Monsanto's Roundup glyphosate is in our air, rainwater. And, you know, it, it's, it can really activate like a, a like a helplessness yeah. that is not, that is, does not serve our purpose ultimately. So my approach tends to focus on the very, you know, intimate things you can control first. And I, I start with diet. I also start with three minutes of Kundalini yoga meditation. It's very simple breathing exercise every day uh, because we need to ease that stress response because you can eat a perfect diet all day long, but if your body is in a fear state, it's not going to do anything for you. The environmental piece is a process. Like you're describing, Ali, I think that's exactly what it should look like. Where you're like at the store one day and you're like, oh, I, I can actually make a different choice about this. I never thought about that, you know, about my face lotion or, I oh, say, should I buy organic tampons today instead yeah. of not? It's a process and it ultimately congeals into a lifestyle, but we're always learning. I love learning about, you know, what different products people have researched. And, you know, I love a website called I Read Labels For You. Irina Webb runs it. And she, this is all she does all day long. This is not all I do all day long. So I love the community element of are discussing together, like, how are we going to approach this together? Because it's a difficult situation we're in. And I mean, if you are changing the things that you're buying, you are then helping the environment. So it's all, it's a win-win. It's a win-win. It's like I, you know, I've said before, it's, we, we've come into this consciousness of connectedness, right? Where we have to understand that what's good for the planet, what's good for you is good for me. There's no way around it. If I engage in activities on a daily basis that harm the planet, it is directly blowing back on me. So listen, if it has to come from a selfish place, then let it, you know, if it has to come from like what's in my best interest, it turns out what's in your best interest is exactly the same thing that's in the best interest of of the ecosystem at large. Yeah, I said to Juliet before we started, I loved how you summed that up. Like, because I think people think, oh my God, there's so many decisions, da, da, da. But like the great litmus test is, what you talk about in your book is, or actually maybe it was on the, I li- was listening to a functional forum podcast you did, but is it good for me? Is it good for the environment? <laughs> it, and those two things aren't, I think about walking, right? Like, okay, walking is good for the environment and good for me or. 100%. So simple. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the irony, right? Well, Kelly, thank you so much, everyone. I will have um, the book again is called A Mind of Your Own, What Women Can Do About Depression That Big Pharma Can't. So I should I should tell you, Ali, it's funny because we didn't talk too much about the evolution of my 
a warring stance as an activist, but we've actually changed the subtitle. Oh, okay. Uh, (laughs) What's your new subtitle, Kelly? How women can do, um, how women can heal their bodies to reclaim their lives. So it's basically, you know, a little bit what we're for rather than against. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. I'm listen, I'm growing and changing and I can, you know, put down my battle ax at some points. And the truth is, this isn't, this isn't, it's not anti it's not anti pharma. It's pro information and it's pro a very different orientation around consciousness and lifestyle. It's not even available to pharma to think in these terms. So this isn't about us versus them. It's really not. And that became more clear to me in, in the past even couple of months, you know, in my own personal journey. So anyway, I just thought to throw that in there. No, I'm glad you said that. I don't trust anyone who knows it all and is never, I mean, it's the irony exactly. again. The it's more true. you learn, the more you realize you don't know. So you just come from this place of, I, I'm not sure. And that's yes. when you really be, I mean, become undogmatic is when you're like, I don't know. That's why it's the only way you can be undogmatic. Is if yes. You but then, and then you develop a sense of different kind of knowing, you know? Yeah. yeah. So Kelly, how can people get a copy of your book and where can they find out more information about you? Where can they connect with you? So I actually have a, on my website, which is kellybroganmd.com, there is, um, we've, we've put together a little bit of an incentivizing opportunity for a bunch of information and there's downloads for, uh, actually it's three things better than Xanax since we were talking about benzodiazepines and a raffle and sort of stuff like that. We just thought would be fun around the book's pre-order because it's on pre-order now through March 15th when it launches. And that's all, you know, directly on, on my website. But I obviously like everyone else. I'm also on, on social media as well. Fabulous. And it's just Kelly Brogan MD everywhere, right? Put on social yeah. media as well. Mm-hmm. You got it. Right? Yeah. I just thought of, you know, you're really pro-choice. Like you've come full circle with your feminist. <laughs> you're like, here's, you're giving people other information, which is giving them other different choices. And that's what I just love about the book is once people know they yeah. have other choices, there's freedom just in knowing that. So it's so true. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for your time, Kelly. And everyone Total go get pleasure. the book. It's amazing. Total <laughs> pleasure to talk with, with you both. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you Kelly. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Insatiable Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. You can connect with us on social media. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Juliet Unite and Ali at Ali M Shapiro. M stands for Marie. Please feel free to also email us any questions. We would love to hear from all our listeners. You can reach us at Ali at Ali Shapiro.com and Juliet at UniteFitness.com. We'll see you next time.